preparing our hearts. We are in the final week of a series, and the series that we have been in is called the Q&A with Jesus, to where Jesus asked questions, but then he also gave answers. And so each time that Jesus asked a question, we have this opportunity to respond. And so this being the final week of those questions, you're going to have an opportunity to respond. You've had this opportunity each week. And we've gone through the things that we all go through. We've gone through the things that we doubt. We've gone through the things that we struggle with. We've gone through the things, the what ifs, the if only, the all those things. And then we have an answer that each one of us has personally. So once again today, Jesus is going to ask a question. And you have this opportunity and this ability to have a response. Your response is your response. It doesn't make it the wrong response. It doesn't make it the right response. It's the response that you have between you and God. And where you take it is your choice. But know this, that there's many times that people are like, well, did God move? Did God move? God move? God hasn't moved. If you're three steps away, five steps away, ten steps away from God is where you feel you are. God's really just one step away. But it's up to you to take that step. His word says, if we draw close to him, he will draw close to us. So if he hasn't changed, it's many times we found that, that we are the ones that change. So we're going to be in Mark today. And if you are looking at the New Testament, it's one of the Gospels, Matthew, then Mark. We're going to be in chapter 10. Before we do that, I want to read you a little story here that I got last week, and I thought, wow, that's a really, really, really cool story. And then I started thinking more and more about it, and I thought, it really points to each one of us. It points to us the, the desires and dreams and everything that we have within our lives. And yet the story is about three trees. It says, once there were three trees on a hill in the woods, they were discussing their hopes and dreams when the first tree said, Someday, I hope to be a treasure chest. I could be filled with gold, silver, and precious gems. I could be decorated with intricate carving, and everyone would see the beauty. Then the second tree said, Someday, I will be a mighty ship. I will take kings and queens across the waters and sail to the corners of the world. Everyone will feel safe in me because of the strength of my hall. Finally, the third tree said, Someday, I want to grow up to be the tallest and straightest tree in the forest. People will see me on top of the hill and look up to my branches and think of the heavens and God and how close to meet them I am reaching. I will be the greatest tree of all time and people will always remember me. The tree was happy because he knew that the carpenter would make him into a treasure chest. The second, at the se oh, that missed part? I did. All right, here we go. Yeah. I would be the, let me go back here. I would be the greatest tree of all time. That's why I don't reach that. Because I can't mess it up. All right. I would be the greatest tree of all time. And people will always remember me. After a few years of praying that their dreams would come true, a group of woodsmen came upon the trees. When one came to the first tree, he said, this looks like a strong tree. I think I should be able to sell the wood to the carpenter. And he began cutting it down. The tree was happy because he knew that the carpenter would make him into a treasure chest. At the second tree, the woodsman said, this looks like a strong tree. I should be able to sell it to the shipyard. The second tree was happy because he knew he was on his way to becoming a mighty ship. When the woodsman came up on the third tree, the tree was frightened because he knew that if they cut him down, his dreams would not come true. One of the woodsmen said, I don't need anything special for my tree. I'll take this one. And he cut it down. When the first tree arrived at the carpenters, he was made into a feed box for animals. He was then placed in a barn and filled with hay. This was not at all what he had prayed for. The second tree was cut and made into a small fishing boat. His dreams of being a mighty ship and carrying kings had come to an end. The third tree was cut into large pieces and left alone in the dark. The years went by and the trees forgot about their dreams. See, for each one of us, we start with this hope. We start with this someday, someday, someday. And then we get out into life and responsibilities set in and our roles and everything that we have to do and because of it, at some point, some time, these fields that were completely cut down, were kind of put off the pasture, or maybe put someplace dark, and our dreams, we stop dreaming. I was thinking about my kids the other day, and we were talking and uh, having a discussion around the things that they said when they were younger. And I had a discussion, and my Jacob, who is, is a junior in high school now, when he was a kid, we would, sit, we would all sit around the dinner table, and we'd have discussions about someday. And so his discussion was this, he goes, someday, Dad? When I get older, I'm going to work with Grandpa in his garage during the day. And then, when I'm done working with him and he closes up his shop, 
I'm going to be a police officer. And then, on the days that I'm not being a police officer, I'm going to be a fireman. But in the morning, because Grandpa doesn't like to come in until a little bit later, I'm going to work with you. And I'm going to do whatever it is that you do. So I asked him, I said, well, Jake, I think that's all great. I said, it's great that you want to work with your dad. It's great that you want to work with your grandpa. It's great that you want to serve others and those other different things. I said, but what about a wife and a kids and a family? I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to have all that, too. I said, and a house? He goes, yeah, I'm going to have all those things someday, someday. I'm like, well, I'll tell you what. I said, we'll talk about those as we, as we get moving forward. So here he is. And he's 17 years of age. And he walks in the other day. And he's like, I hate my job. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, he is a sandwich connoisseur at Subway. But he's a junior in high school. And so my whole goal is to try to get him back to someday. Because when he was young, his someday dealt with being with family, maybe working with family, and was serving others. And so for each one of us, our someday, when we turn back to that, if I just gave you those options, hey, if you could be with your family, and if you could serve and love others, would that someday work out for you? Is that a someday that you would love to have? And for each one of us, we'd be like, yeah, that'd be great. And then we stop. But I've got bills I've got to pay. I've got a mortgage. I've got a car payment. I've got debt that you cannot even imagine. My boss wants more and more overtime from me. Everybody wants and wants and wants. I'm expected to coach over here. I need to spend time over there. I've got a PTA meeting coming up. I've got this and that and the other thing. And my schedules are so big and so full that at the end of the day, I just want to sit down and just relax for a little bit. And what I happens to me, what I find that happens is that when I have days like that, I never had any time for God. I never gave any time for God. And all I looked at was my role as a husband, or as a dad, or as a spouse. All I looked at was my role as a parent or a grandparent. All I looked at was my role as a student because I've got six hours of homework and then on top of it, I've got a test coming up and a paper due, and then I've got a sports place to be and I've got this and on and on and on and on. And at the end of the day, I just want to rest. But if I were honest with myself, there was not one time where I spent some time with God and said, someday, someday, God, Someday. Someday, I'll live my faith. Someday, I'll take that step with you. Someday, my kids will be grown enough to where I can follow through. Someday, I'll graduate from school and then, and then, and then. And because of that, we get stuck in this rut and we never live that someday. And yet here's God lovingly standing close to us, and what he wants us to do is to live every day with him. Yes, we're beat up by our schedules. Yes, we've been beat up at work. Yes, we're beat up by school. Yes, we're beat up at the things that are going on around us that we don't want any part in. Some of you, yes, you've even been beat up by the church. You're just beat up because we're doing, 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 doing. And God the entire time is just going, hey, I'm right here. And all I'm asking you to do it's the love. And don't wait until tomorrow. And don't wait until someday. Challenge yourself to start today. This very thing takes place. And we get an example from a man by the name of Bartimaeus today in the, in the book of Mark. This can also be found in Luke. We're going to dive into Mark because there's so much that takes place within this message today. But know this. At the end of the day, I don't want you to wait for someday. We all have those struggles, and many times we think we are alone. We think we're the only one that's gone through a divorce. We think that we're the only one that's lost a loved one. We think we're the only one that's dealt with the sickness. We think we're the only one that are raising kids. We're the only ones that are tired. We're the only ones that our job is the most important thing in the world, and we can't get away from it. But what we find out many, many times is that we're all in the same boat. The struggles may come with a different name. And we all are looking for that someday. Starting at verse 46 in Mark chapter 10. Uh, my Bible has a little title. It says, Blind Bartimaeus Receives His Sight. Let's read through the verses. We're going to dive back in. Starting at verse 36. It says, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting in the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Men rebuked him and told him to be quiet, and he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped him and said, Call him. So they called on the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see you. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, we dive into that. We're like, that is absolutely amazing. So there's a blind guy, and now he's able to see. So Jesus performed this miracle. And many times we read through this, and you've probably heard this story many times in your life. Mark is an amazing writer because he writes everything quick and to the point. Mark was written to the Romans. They need to know right now. Just tell them to me like it is. Don't sugarcoat it. I don't need a bunch of fluff on it. Tell them to me like it is. But there are so many signs as to what's going on in this passage so that you can see this from a different point of view. Not from a different viewpoint, but from a different point of view. So today, we're going to look at this from three different point of views. We're going to look at it from the view of the crowd. We're going to look at it from the view of Bartimaeus. And then we're going to look at it from the view of Jesus as we dive through here. But remember this. There are so many things that are taking place. So I'm hoping you have a pen and paper that you can take some of these notes. But if they can touch each one of them, each one of us can relate to this. To this. Some of us right now are just blind. We're blind in our faith. We just can't see. Some of us are in the crowd are saying all the right things, and sometimes we're saying the wrong things. But we just can't do anything. And some of us, we're just looking for Jesus. And we just want to know that he is there. So we're going to start off the first thing that says, Then they came to Jericho. Now the first thing to understand about Jericho is that Jericho is the oldest inhabited city in the world. The Jericho that is of today is actually a little bit further south than the original Jericho. When Joshua came across, they shouted and all the walls came down. They all fell in. A geographical dig, by the way, of that place proved that all the walls went inward. And this city was then covered up. And so because of it, rather than rebuild, because it's so difficult to rebuild in the city, they moved it further south. The Jericho is the oldest of all the inhabited cities in the world. So this is where everything literally, for, for you and I, literally where everything goes back to the start. It says, as Jesus and his disciples together, with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting on the roadside. Begging. Now, here's the interesting thing. Notice it says Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Anytime you see the name that starts with Bar, Bar means the son of. So Bartholomew is literally the son of Tholomew. Okay? Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus. The only thing I had to figure out is I had a neighbor her name is Barbara. So she's the son of, son of A. Son of, son of A. And then I thought, what if the two bars, like two negatives and a positive, become so then the son of, son of becomes daughter of? So now she's daughter of A. Her last name is Carmichael, now it's Wilson. So she's daughter of A. Carmichael Wilson. You got that? So if you don't know the bar, the beginning of the name, Bartholomew, but all those other kind of things, that is a son of that person. It's kind of cool, isn't it? So Timaeus is his father. Here's the interesting thing. Timaeus' name means the unclean one. So Bartimaeus, who is blind, is the son of the unclean one. Because the people at this time felt, if you were blind, then you were cursed. If you were blind, there was something obviously wrong with you. God has already sentenced you, and you are done. And so what else can a blind person do at this time but beg? And so here's this guy that everyone looks down upon. They don't look down upon him because he's a beggar. They look down upon him because he is blind, and that is what they have been taught. And many times there are things in our lives that we have been taught, and it doesn't necessarily make them right. It doesn't necessarily make them true. There are things that you may have been taught within the Bible that aren't necessarily true. They aren't in there. But we don't take the time to spend in it. And because we don't take that time, we cannot really hear from God. Some of you go through some struggles right now, and you're like, I am praying, I am praying, I am praying. And that's fantastic. Are you spending any time here? Are you spending some time with God so you can hear Him, so it's just you and Him? The church is beating me up. My work is beating me up. My family is beating me up. That's great. I'm praying. That's great. Are you spending time here? Let me give you a couple of examples. People have taught something called the age of accountability. It's nowhere in here. There's no terms in here in any version that says this is the age of accountability. It's not in there. You've been taught Jesus comes rolling out of the tomb because we see it every Easter. Guess what? It's not in there. So there's example after example after example. If we don't spend the time in his word, how will we ever know? So here's the son of the unclean one. 
and he's sitting alongside of the road. The son of the unclean one is now a beggar, because that's all that the beggar is able to do. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, let's stop here for a second. The word Jesus, Jesus is the Greek term. In Hebrew, Jesus is Joshua. Joshua first came to Jericho. Everybody knows who Joshua is. The priest set the, their feet in the water. The Jordan River parted. Jo uh, Joshua came across. They went to the other side, and they took over Jericho because that was the promised land. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and now here he is, and they see him as Joshua. He is now coming to the same city of Jericho. And his role is to lead people to the land of promise. And all these people that can see, everybody that's in the crowd, all the religious leaders, they know all of these things. And yet, who is the first person to step up to truly get this? The blind, unclean guy that's already been cursed to hell according to everything that has been taught. So it continues, he says... When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In his mind, Joshua, he who saved, Joshua, Jesus, have mercy on me. And so what does the crowd do? Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So many times the crowd wants to tell us how it is that we should live. The crowd wants to tell us how it is that we should pray. The crowd wants to tell us how it is that we should worship. You can't use drums, you can't use stringed instruments, you can't sing the modern stuff. Everyone wants to tell us how it is that we should walk in our faith. And too many times we take direction from the world and not from the Word. If you're a praying person, I love it, it's fantastic. But you will continue to be blind until you truly understand that the power that Jesus and the Holy Spirit has upon you, and it's written right here. It's so wonderful that we have the opportunity to spend this time together. But your time in here and your time with Jesus is the only thing that's going to help you to stop being blind. No matter what the crowd says, no matter what they yell at you, no matter how they rebuke you, over and over and over, this is where the blinders come off. The crowd continues. It says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they stopped, they called the blind man and said, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Now all of a sudden, Joshua slash Jesus, the one that you hear is Joshua, the one that we know is Jesus, who's been going around and healing people and helping people that are blind and raising people from the dead, all this thing he's doing. Now, oh, he wants to help you. So now we'll take a step back because we will now allow that because we're the crowd. So, okay, cursed guy. Hey, guess what? We all stop, so let's do this because obviously this guy has more to say. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. We're going to stop there for a second. The crowd, the crowd, the crowd. Don't do that. Don't act this way. You can't pray like that. You can't stand that. You can't hold your hands up. You can't wear sweatpants. You can't read from this version of the Bible. All these things over and over and over and over that we hear that are struggles throughout churches everywhere. And we deal with them all the time. And we go back to this every time. Love others as Christ loved you. Go and make disciples in his name. Love others as Christ loves you. Go and make disciples in his name. That is the New Testament. That is God's word summed up into two sentences. And you're like, oh, well, I already know everything. No, you don't. You still have your blinders on. I still have my blinders on at time. It's so easy to get there. I'll give you a perfect example. We have a, a young man who is so talented musically, it's unbelievable. And so... I was of the mindset, listen, if he can't be here three of the four weeks in church, then he can't be up on stage. We're going to find someone else to play guitar. And the bottom line was is that he had a talent that God had blessed him with, and he was using that. What I didn't know is he was working about 80 hours a week, and he was requesting off those Sundays to be here with us. 
And so I was very hardened to it. I had some people call me. I'm not soften on this. I've made a decree. Where it's it. It's written in stone. Don't, don't call me anymore about it. I was very hardened about it. And that was a discussion I was having with two other people. And guess what? I started praying about it. And I started reading. And my heart started to soften. And I started praying. And I started reading. And so I reached out to this young man. And we started having a discussion. And then he started telling me a story. And telling me how he's working 80 hours a week. And how those couple Sundays off, I'm able to request off. And they'll give me those Sundays off so that I can be there to worship. And all of a sudden I realized, my goodness, John. You have a guy here that's at least willing to be here. Who gets our hearts prepared. And will take that time to be here to listen to God's word. And then an amazing thing happened. He started coming to church on his own. Without anybody else. He was here one week, and two weeks, and three weeks. And I asked him, hey, how are you going to get off? He said, just right now, I want to feel the overtime. And when I can't do the overtime, then I'm here. And so you know what I had to do? I called those other guys. I said, you guys are right. My heart was so hardened toward it that I wasn't listening to God. But I'll tell you what, I had my stance. I drew the line in the sand, and I was wrong. I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. And the more that I see him, and the more that he is here, I am so excited to see him every time he's here. He hugs me. We talk about what's going on in his life. I've met his girlfriend. She is coming along. I see them growing together. I see them walking together. I see God first in their life, and I see someone who loves the Lord. And I didn't see it because I was blind. It's so easy to happen. And so many times, we can't see the heart of a person because we don't take the time to do so. We don't take the time to prayer, and most of it, we don't spend any time here. And if we don't do that, how in the world can we ever expect to hear from God if we don't open His love letter? But this is what the crowd says. This is what the crowd says. This is what the crowd says. And the crowd of one was pushing people away. Pushing one person away. Thankfully, I have enough guys around me that I've, I've only screwed up once so far with that. So far, I'll, get, I'll do it again. Don't worry. We all do it, okay? That's what the crowd said. Now let's go back a little bit. Here's what the crowd said. Let's go back now and let's look at this from the standpoint of Bartimaeus. Starting in verse 46, he's sitting along the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he said son of David, that meant Jesus, the Messiah, Joshua, the Messiah, as I know Joshua, this is Jesus, though. This is Jesus of Nazareth. The Messiah is the Christ. The Messiah is the one they've been looking for. And all the crowd and all the people that are following, even though they've heard everything that Jesus has to say and they love his teachings, they're looking and going, what are you talking about? How in the world are you calling him the son of David? That means that you believe that he is truly the Messiah and comes along the lineage of David. And this is the one that we've been looking for. And you can't even see him. He couldn't see him. And yet in his heart, he knew. He, could see, he couldn't see anything within this world. And yet in his heart, he knew. And so the first thing we see about him is that Bartimaeus is someone who is very humble. He says, have mercy on me. He humbles himself. Because he is believing and has believed that he is cursed. So in his mind, says, I am so cursed, I need to first humble myself before the Lord. And so I'm saying, Jesus, Messiah, the one we've been looking for, would you have mercy on me? Because no one else will. Because no one else can. But you can. The story continues. He says, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted on the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said to him, Call him. So they called on the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. The cloak that he has is a beggar's cloak. And just like you see people that are alongside the road nowadays that are supposed to have a panhandler or some kind of license so that they're allowed to actually ask for money, he had a special cloak that he had. It would have been striped so that people could see the difference. If it's a solid color, that's a religious the person with a, a, has like a white, blue, things like that. White with blue, that means it's a religious person. Most people are wearing a, a, a whitish, kind of an off-whitish robe at this time. It's usually a solid color. But if it's striped, that's a beggar. He's allowed to beg. The only thing that this beggar has in his life is that cloak. And it says he threw his cloak aside 
and jumped to his feet. He has been begging here. People are throwing coins on him. Think about this for a second from Bartimaeus' standpoint. At the end of the day, he folds his cloak up, he takes in all the stuff he has, and he has to start feeling the stuff that he's got for the day. Yep, that's Caesar's image. I can put this here. Caesar's image. I can put this here. Somebody threw in a button. This is see. Oh no, that's a token from Chuck E. Cheese. That's a, this is what he has to do. He can't see it. This is his life. And then someone comes along and says, look it, we're the one that put you here today. We're keeping 20% of whatever we have or whatever it is that you collected because it's our finders here for bringing you. We're going to drop you off back at your home. We're going to pick you back up again tomorrow at 8. We're going to start all over again. Make sure you have your cloak, for which Bartimaeus says, that's all I have. It's not a problem. They have no idea if this guy's taking 20% or 30% or 50%. And this is his life every single day. He literally is taking his cloak and throwing it aside with everything he has to jump to Jesus because he believes that Jesus can make a change in his life. There was no doubt going on. And the reason I know that is because he threw away every single thing he had to get to him. He got rid of his savings. He got rid of his retirement. He got rid of his car. He got rid of his house. He got rid of whatever it is that we tie ourselves into every single month, over and over and over, that literally rules over us. Because he believed that Jesus could heal that. So it continues. He says, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. So now let's take a look at this from Jesus' standpoint. Same story, we're going to start in verse 48. Men rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. By the way, let me go back here for a second for, for, for Bartimaeus. Not only, not only did he humble himself, he didn't stop, did he? He was tenacious and kept coming back. And so many times we take something to God and we do it one time. We do it, we hear a message on Sunday, like, oh, that spoke to me. And so on Monday, I'm going to take it to God. I'm going to take it to him over and over and over. And on Tuesday, I'm going to take it to him pretty well. And by Wednesday, it's like, oh, my goodness, I have to work overtime. No, 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 no. And by Friday, it's like, what was it again that I was taking to God? I'll just start over again Sunday. And we get in this vicious cycle over and over and over again. This guy has been waiting his entire life to meet the Messiah, as every Jew has been. And now that Jesus is in his sight and he can't see him, he's not going to stop bringing it to him. I was listening to a story the other day about a woman who prayed and prayed and prayed for her mom because her mom was so of the world and she had screwed everything up and she had left her dad and she had just gone on to do her thing and she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and, prayed. and after 22 years of praying, her mom accepted Christ and 22 years and about a month later, her mom chose to be baptized to show what was going on on the inside. And when they were done and they had moved on, they were going to the church, and the preacher came through, and he found this woman crying. And he was like, why are you crying? He goes, this should be one of the happiest days of your life. And she says, I've been praying for 22 years for my mom, and I can't tell you how many times I almost gave up. And so he asked her, why didn't you? He said, because every time I would dive into his word, I knew that I was the one that needed to show her that love. And so I kept coming and coming and coming. And the culmination of all of it was her mom taking that step of faith. Be tenacious. Don't stop. Whatever it is that you're blind to, but God wants to show you. Are you willing to see that? And are you willing to keep coming with it? Because Bartimaeus was. So it continues here with Jesus. It says, uh, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. When Jesus stopped, what would the crowd do? Did they keep walking? No. What would Bartimaeus do? He's in the same spot all the time. But do you think he all of a sudden heard all the footsteps stopping? Because every day he's listening because he can't hear, so his hearing is that much better. I'm sorry, he can't see, but his hearing is that much better. So all of a sudden, everything stops. The world is stopping around them. Jesus has stopped, and all the crowd stops. And Jesus says to the same crowd that's rebuking him, call him. 
So they call to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet. He's calling you, throwing his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And it's at this moment, because everyone has stopped, that this blind man is before who he sees as Joshua, who he knows as Jesus of Nazareth, who he understands can take him to the land of promise, who he understands, only he understands, is the Messiah. Jesus' disciples didn't even understand at this point. This guy knew that he is the Messiah. And now Jesus stops for a second so that he can ask a question that we all need to ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, which is to say teacher, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And for us, let's go back to us being the crowd. This is why we stop. If we don't get the answer that we want immediately right now, we move on. Even though God may be moving, even though God may be doing something that we can't see, we don't trust him enough to believe that he can handle it. And here's why. He's not going on our schedule. He's not fixing things when we want him to fix them. And then when he's fixing them, he's not fixing them the right way. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. Where's my energy? I don't have it today. Oh my goodness, we can't fix it. You know what? I don't know what the next step to take is. I know I need to be around people, but I don't want to go around people. I don't want to see people. I'm terrible with my finances. I've always been terrible with my finances. You know what I'll do? I'll go on and spend because God hasn't fixed them. And so over and over and over, we'll ask the question one time, and then boom, we're done, and we move on. Because he didn't answer it for us immediately. For this blind man, he has been waiting his whole life. He has been praying his whole life. He has been seeking his whole life. And he has been seeking what everybody else is looking for. And that's the hope to the Christ through Messiah. And he's here. And so now he has the opportunity to seek in person. And so Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He stops everybody in their tracks. And then one-on-one, -on -one, he looks to him, and he asks a question that penetrates every heart that is around. So let me ask you a question. If you had the opportunity to ask Jesus, if you had the opportunity to seek Jesus and ask him for one thing, what would it be? If he were to say to you, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is it that you want me to do for you? What is it? You ever thought of it that way? God, I want you to help me. I want you to help me win the lottery. Because then I can make $400 million and I can fix so many things because of it. And if you can't balance a checkbook and your finances are so screwed up, so you've already screwed it up with a little, and so now you want a lot, so you can really screw it up. 84% of lottery winners are bankrupt within 18 months. <laughs> oh, maybe that's not such a good thing. That's actually a good point. God, I want you, I want you to bring world peace. Really? That's what you want is world peace, because world peace points to the end times, and if you're not where you need to be from a spiritual standpoint, you still aren't a place to where you're going to spend eternity with them. But that sounds good, doesn't it? What is it that you want God to do for you? I want him to help me to lose 20 pounds. But I want to exercise. I don't want to change my diet. I want to help, have him help me to be a better husband or a better wife. Yet I don't want to think about my spouse first and put her first in my thoughts. I want you to help me to be a better kid so people can see a better example of me. Yet I still want to hang out with the kids in the back. I still want to try drinking. I still want to smoke for the first time. I still want to cuss and let no one knows. I want you to strike that guy with lightning or hit that guy in the face with a shovel. <laughs> Let's be honest. There's some people in your lives who are like, hey, this is not like such a bad thing. That seems like a simple request. God, you can do that. But then after that would happen, how do you really think that you would feel? So when Jesus asked this question of this blind guy, the answer seems like it would be obvious, doesn't it? Well, when I ask you that question, is the answer obvious? 
Is your first question back for what Jesus wants to do for you, is it obvious? Because I think the more that we spend the time in that, the more that we realize it isn't as obvious as we think it is. And yet for this guy, it was plainly for everyone to see. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus does this. He says one word. Go. Go. You're, you're going to be able to see here right away. But you need to understand something. Go. And you're going to be able to see where it is you're walking. And you can see what it is that you left behind with your cloak and all the coins all over the place. But go. And why? Because your faith has healed you. We're tired. We're beaten up. We all have struggles. Easter was this great time of resurrection. We thought everything was going to change. And nothing did. We have something going on that there's no one that can heal it. And you're right. But Jesus can. The Holy Spirit was promised for each one of us. And it's a step of faith to go and walk alongside with him. The story of the three trees ends this way. Someday. 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 The years went by and the trees forgot about their dreams. Then one day, a man and a woman came to the barn. She gave birth and they placed the baby in the hay in the seed box that was made from the first tree. The man wished that he could have made a crib for the baby, but this manger would have to do. The tree could feel the importance of this event and knew that it held the greatest treasure of all time. Years later, a group of men got in a fishing boat made for the second tree. One of them was tired and went to sleep. While they were out on the water, a great storm arose and the tree didn't think it was strong enough to keep the men safe. The men woke the sleeping man and he stood and said, Peace, and the storm stopped. At this time, the tree knew that it had carried the king of kings in its boat. Finally, someone came and got the third tree. It was carried through the streets as the people mocked the man who was carrying it. When they came to a stop, the man was nailed to the tree and raised in the air to die at the top of the hill. When Sunday came, the tree came to realize it was strong enough to stand at the top of the hill and be as close to God as, as was possible as Jesus had been crucified on. The moral of the story is that when things don't seem to be going your way, always know that God has a plan for you. If you place your trust in Him, God will give you great gifts. Each of the trees got what they wanted, just not in the way that they had imagined. We don't always know what God's plan is for us, we just know that His ways are not our ways, but His ways are always Yes. And we'll hold on to that story of the trees, and we'll think about that story of the trees, and we'll go back and forth to that story of the trees, so that we'll stop saying, someday, 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 and allow God to move. And it's a fantastic illustration. But the greatest illustration is the one that Jesus gave us when he healed the son of the unclean one. When he reached out and touched the one who was no longer was not clean, that nobody cared for, him, that everybody looked down for him, that was so busy in his job that he couldn't see out of it, that was so stuck in his everyday rut that it was all that he knew, that was being treated poorly, that was being made fun of, that was being mocked for his faith, that was being put down, that was complacent, that was probably very anxious. Worry and doubt. It. And he said to him, What is it that you want me to do for you? He was humble, he was tenacious, and he believed that over time that God could fix and heal anything. The way only God can. Go. Your faith is making you. Just stand, please, and close a word of prayer.